you look at something like an iPhone, for example, where is the value of an iPhone actually realized? Even though it's all assembled in China, 55% of the end retail price of an iPhone is captured by American companies, less than 2% in China because of how global value chains are organized. The components are assembled in China using low-cost labor, but that's all the value that's added there is those assembly and all the components are produced internationally, imported into China and then shipped out. So that looks like a trade deficit on the American side. But actually, if you look where value is captured, it's captured mostly by American companies. So what do you say to those people who say, well, China's actually become the workshop of the world, mm -hmm. therefore all that consumer spending going into China as opposed to uh, onshoring it or keeping it in America, say, has actually uh, bolstered their coffers and also bolstered their ability to spend militarily mm -hmm. and therefore, strategically, they are sitting in a much more rosy position than you depict. Well, that's all true. I mean, so that's much more true today than it was 20 years ago. But there are massive caveats to that. Like I've just said, the iPhone crystallizes the issue about value chains. So with China being the workshop of the world, that's true. But a lot of it is low value added assembly work. That's what's been outsourced from Western economies. Mm. Control over the patents, control over technology, over high end value added activity is still mostly retained in the core of the global capitalist economy. And a lot of the trade war between the United States and China now is because China is trying various mechanisms to break out of that position at the bottom of the value-added ladder. So it's stealing technologies, right, it's doing least. forced technology right. transfers and right. so on to try to climb that global value chain. And that is uniquely threatening to the rent-seeking companies that sit at the top of these global value chains, mostly located in the United States, Japan, Europe, and so on because it offers a way of trying to break you out of that middle income trap. The Americans are squealing. You're a waning power as a US citizen. You're a waning power, but ultimately, unipolarity may prevail. I don't know. I, I'm not as optimistic as the professor here. <laughs> as rosy, I'm more of a... Is it optimistic to I, say US hegemony will continue? I, don't I think, think so. I think US dollar hegemony is finished. I think that the US, as I describe in my book, has probably $250 trillion in debt that can never be repaid. And the Apple example that you gave, the valuation of Apple's company is almost a trillion dollars, which is insane. Because I have, for example, I just purchased that, is it, I don't know how to pronounce it, Hawaii, 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 Hawaii Pro 30. And I also have the iPhone 10. And I'll tell you, the technology in that Chinese phone is 50 times better than the iPhone 10. So if you look at that and you also look at where the population and the military growth in China, I think we are moving more towards a multipolar world where they're going to have more of a say. Apple did own the technology market, but at the end of the day, it's a technology company. It's not drilling for oil like ExxonMobil, mm -hmm. so it can't command a trillion dollar market cap. I think that they've had their heyday, the new products. I think the markets are saturated with technology products that have come from Silicon Valley. Are they stealing technology? Absolutely. Do I think tariffs are part of the solution? Absolutely. Do I think, and I've said this a year ago, the way that conflict starts in the world is you, first you have trade wars that lead to currency wars that lead to hot wars. Mm -hmm.